Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we assemble today, as we consider what our Heavenly Father had presented for us through his word and through his prophet, shall we thank him for the many blessings that he is giving, for the direction that he is providing, and for the light that we are finding for the steps on his path. As we look to draw closer to him and draw closer to the work that is yet to be performed. Shall we open our, our time together with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, there is much that we need to understand. There is much precious light that you are providing. Light that we need to be guided by in this time of Earth's history, in this time of this movement's history. We ask now, Father, for your guidance and your direction. Help us as we open your word, as we consider that which you have sent through your prophet, that this light may guide our steps, and that this word <clears throat> may not fall upon deaf ears. I thank you for each one that are joining together this morning on this Sabbath. And we thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we have to come before you, to be directed by you, so that we may be guided in this path to understand the work that you would have us to do. May your will be done. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity, for we know that we have sinned. We know our, that we have a great need of you. We lay our sins at the cross and thank you for this opportunity that we may learn to become men and women, according to your character and according to the mold that you would place upon us. For this, we thank you and this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Last week, as we have been studying over the last several weeks, the book of Zephaniah, a subject was brought up. I was led to look through the writings of Sister White at specific passages and to consider carefully items that she had had to say on the subject that is right now before us. For this subject goes directly with the study of Zephaniah. Now, if you have a problem with what is about to be addressed. If you have an issue with it, feel free to bring your comments up, but let us also remember what is about to be addressed. I have not written. If we have a problem with this, we need to take this up with the heavenly author. The forces and powers of darkness are mustering for the closing work of this earth's history. Oh, how earnest should we be to examine ourselves. Which vision 
do we find when we are examining ourselves? We are in positive danger of losing our souls when we are criticizing others, remarking others' failures. We must examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. <clears throat> 1, 3, 5. This is taken from letter 102, 1886, paragraph 9 and paragraph 10. Now we should think of our state before God. How carefully should we seek to obtain a knowledge of ourselves from the word of God? Where shall we stand in the future crisis that shall come? Shall we stand as children of God at his right hand or as disobedient, unthankful, and unholy at his left hand? The unsearchable riches of Christ should engage our attention now. The honor that cometh from God is above every earthly honor. Our souls must be securely riveted to the rock of ages. She took the time to write a letter. This is found as letter 19, 1887 to the brethren and sisters in St. Helena. This was provided October 24th, 1887, and was previously unpublished. <clears throat> so, this is a letter that went to the brothers and sisters in St. Helena prior to the 1888 General Conference session. From that time, until 1915, so for 128 years, this letter had remained unpublished. Dear brothers and sisters in St. Helena, there has been a great deal of gossiping over certain things that have happened among you, but you all know that scandal and gossip are condemned in the scriptures and by the testimonies of the Spirit of God. Brother Rice has been blind and needed the heavenly anointing, but he is not alone in error. His brethren have also failed to do the will of God. If they had come to him in the spirit of meekness, in the spirit of Christ, and had patiently labored with him, striving to recover him from the snare of the enemy, if they had done their whole duty in the fear of God, according to his word, let <clears throat> telling him his fault in the private way that the Lord has directed, they would have been clear in the sight of heaven. But as they have departed from the plain injunction of the Lord, condemnation rests upon them. Too many times we are quick to criticize. We are quick to condemn. There have been too many that have been the recipient of this type of condemnation when this is not according to God's path and according to his will. Those who have believed the evil reports and have repeated them to others have utterly disregarded the lesson that Jesus left on record for those who profess to be his disciples. In censuring those who have been engaged in gossip, I do not refer to the board of directors whose duty it is to investigate these reports that come to them concerning those in the employee of the institution. It is positively essential that the moral tone of the retreat should be of a high character, and in a case of this kind, it is only prudent to examine the matter most thoroughly. Achan stole and dissembled, and his sin was charged upon the whole camp of Israel. Achan. 
is again being brought up. <clears throat> he knew that when he took the golden wedge and the Babylonian garment, he was acting contrary to the command of the God of Israel. The Lord had said, and ye in any wise keep yourself from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourself accursed, Joshua 6.18. If matters of difficulty between brethren are not laid open together, but frankly spoken of between themselves in the spirit of Christian love, the difficulty would in nearly every case be healed and the brother won. Misunderstandings have arisen that have been thus explained in Christian tenderness and the breach has been healed. When brethren come together in harmony, with the directions of Christ, Jesus himself is the witness of the scenes. And the whole universe looks with intense interest upon the man who not only believes, but does the word of Christ. The spirit of God will move upon the heart of him who has erred when Christ's words are carried out. And the one at fault will be convicted of his error. But if he is too proud, too self-sufficient to confess the wrong, Others are to be taken in order to follow out the complete directions of the word. But if he will not hear thee in private interview, take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Matthew 18, 15, and 16. The matter of difficulty is to be confined to as small a number as, as possible but two or three are to labor with the one who is in error. They should not only talk with him, but bow in prayer and with humble hearts seek the Lord. And if he shall neglect to hear, then tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, if he persists in his unreasonable course and will not be corrected, then there is only one more step to be taken, and that is a very sorrowful one. Let him be unto thee as a heathen and a publican. Verse 17. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Verse 18. When every specification which Christ has given has been carried out in true Christian spirit, then, and then only, heaven ratifies the decision of the church, because its members have the mind of Christ and do as he would have done had he been here. Brethren, it must be made manifest that we are not only Bible readers, but doers of the words of Christ. Those who, fully, <clears throat> those who fully trust in the Lord Jesus will be obedient children and will have guidance from above. The mind and will of God are made plain in the living oracles. In our churches, we should not act as though we were groping our way in the dark. Since December 6th, there has been much groping in the dark. We have been studying, but as a movement, we are groping. Clear light has been given us, the Lord, has spoken to everyone in his word. And that word is luminous with light <clears throat> and waiting with precious ore of truth. In the Bible, we have a perfect rule on conduct and we will be safe in following it. Does the Bible show anywhere where we should have a critical condemning spirit? With reverent hearts, we should bow to God's expressed will. We are not left in uncertainty, for in 
all the varied circumstances of life. We walk in accordance with the instructions of God, which are based upon the golden principles of truth and revealed in the precepts of his love in the Bible. There are rules to meet every case. A complete system of faith has been revealed and correct rules for practice in our daily lives have been made known. Those who will turn from the beaten path marked out in God's word because it suits their feelings better to do so than to work according to the commandment. Leave the light and are enshrouded in darkness. Peace of mind, of happiness, and heaven are sacrificed for the sake of maintaining human pride and multiplying and indulging stubbornness of will. Let this thought sink in. <clears throat> Is this what we are called to do at this time? We are not to place our dependence upon man, nor expect homage from our fellow men. <clears throat> Jesus said, be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ. And all ye are brethren, call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Matthew 23, 8 and 9. We should remember that the best and the most intelligent men have only a limited ability. And we should pray for discernment to understand what is each man's true place. How often have we done this? How often have we considered this admonition? We are not to be blind. We may see the prejudices which some have, and which are criticized by those with whom we associate. We may see the errors that hinder their religious growth. We may discern their instability of opinion, their partiality of action. But because we see this, we should not feel that we are superior to them, measuring ourselves among ourselves and leaning to our own understanding. As we see the deficiencies of others, it should lead us to have less self-confidence, to be jealous of our own spirit and action. No living man should come in to take the place of God in your mind. Call no man father upon, the, upon earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Matthew verses 9 through 12. <clears throat> These words of Christ are not only to be read, but are to be obeyed to the letter. How are we to do this? Obey completely. Those who meekly and humbly pursue their course of duty, not to be praised, petted, and honored of men, but to glorify God, will receive as their reward glory, honor, and eternal life. <clears throat> but many are so lifted up in spiritual pride that they act as though it were not enjoined upon them to live in harmony with the instruction of Christ. We are to walk in humility before God, and we can do this as the clear light of heaven reveals Christ's perfection of character 
and we see in contrast the weakness and imperfection of our own. Those who have a view of Christ in contrast with self will not feel like boasting. They will not lift up self, but will appreciate the value of the souls for whom Christ died. <clears throat> you will see, brethren, by the writing dated October 24th, 1887, that I have called your attention to certain rules that the Lord requires us to observe. I have great sorrow of heart that these rules have been so strangely neglected by those who profess to be the followers of Christ. Merely reading the Bible, believing the Bible will not save any of us, for it is only doers of the word that shall be justified. If only doers of the word shall be justified, how can those that do not the word seek to be sanctified? <clears throat> Have any of us ever considered this writing dated October 24th, 1887? What I found interesting as I, as I was being led to put this document together, this is not the only time that she gives reference to this writing. Yet how often is this being given reference within the movement? I know of nothing more injurious to the soul than this habit of talking of one, uh, one another's errors, of reporting every unfavorable tale that is brought to your ears, and of magnifying the mistakes of a brother. When a brother's fault comes to your notice, how much better it would be to go to him with it, following out the Bible rule that has been given by him who owns the souls of all men. An infinite price has been paid for the ransom of the souls of men from the power of the enemy. And how terrible it is for one who professes to love God to set forth the mistakes and errors of his brother in high colors, doing a wicked work against Jesus in the person of his saints. The rebuke of God is against all who engage in such work. They are doing the work of Satan. The Lord has declared, inasmuch as ye did it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye did it unto me. <clears throat> what does that passage now say to you? When we choose to criticize our brother, who are we really criticizing? What has Mrs. White said here? while we're criticizing Christ. Is there any reason for us to criticize Christ? No valid reason. This one point struck hard to my heart. If we are choosing to criticize a brother or a sister, if we are choosing to magnify their faults without following that which God 
has laid out in scripture. We are criticizing then Christ. Do we have any cause to do this? Do we have any cause ever to criticize the one that heaven provided at infinite cost for our salvation? <clears throat> if there is one thought we take away from today, May it be this. When Christians accuse and condemn their brethren, they show themselves to be in the service of the accuser of the brethren. Brothers and sisters, whose banner is being lifted up when we accuse others? Whose banner are we standing under? Whose banner is being exalted when we accuse and condemn brothers and sisters? Well, Satan's bat banner that's being exalted. Is that what you want? Is that what any of you want? Yes, this is hard to speak of. Yes, this is hard to present. It's also hard to consider. And I would suggest that it's, it's only hard for a while. And then once you start um, handling it more and more often, it becomes much easier. But yeah, in the beginning, it's it's terribly complex. I've spent a long time trying to catch up, a long time. And I still hadn't felt like I'd caught up until just a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, more to the point, um, I think it was understand the new lines 188. That, okay. things be, that things became uh, really, really um, um, opened up to me at that point because I started to, I started to see stuff that I, I hadn't saw before. Uh, and and um, as, as uh, Theodore had, had said, you know, it's kind of hard for your mind to get over that, that hurdle. But once you have gotten over that hurdle, things become a lot easier. I mean, it's just a matter of time. That's, it just takes time and the handling, as Theodore had once said before. And also, um, Jeff. Uh, Jeff kept questioning us to say, can you present this stuff? Right. Right? And, and that was just something that I could not do. Uh, for, for as many years that I'd been into it, I was just mostly uh, in the background listening to all this stuff, trying to study it out. I, I had no confidence in what anything I said. And because and especially at a couple of times that I had said something early on that I was um, corrected quite quickly. Not that I minded it or anything. It was just that, you know, I, I prefer to be better in, uh, in a depth of knowledge where I don't have to be corrected all the time. You, you feel what I'm saying there? I do. And, and I finally have, I feel that I've reached it, but it's taken me a long time to do it. And it, it, it seems a little discouraging, but all I got to say is, is that it can happen if you persist. But the point is the message that uh, Dwight is presenting about criticism um, I mean, this is a message that is not generally welcome. Oh, no. Because the one thing we like to do more than anything else is criticize others. Yes, it's just in our nature. I mean, it's super, I mean, it really is because everybody does yeah. it. 
Yeah, but so the question is, are we going to continue to do this to the destruction? Well, of, we have to recognize it and then try to correct it. Uh, if we don't recognize it or won't acknowledge it, we'll never be able to correct it. Yeah, so it's something we have to recognize in ourselves. That's right. Easy to recognize it in others. It's easy. Oh, to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to see that others are criticizing, um, you know, us, especially if they're criticizing us. It's easy to see. Mm -hmm. It's harder for us to recognize if we're criticizing others. Mm. Isn't that why you've had so much problems over the years when you try to explain yourself? so well that there's no chance that they can misunderstand you still upset them because of it <laughs> well yeah okay so yeah. i mean but I, that's I, not really the question the question is about ourselves right so we have to examine ourselves are we are we lifting up the banner of christ in meekness and loneliness or are we just ready to, to see the faults in others because it's easy to see that somebody has criticized us, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's the point I think about the difficulty of the message, the message that that Dwight's giving right now. Mm. Yeah, it's very easy to criticize others. Once we can start criticizing ourselves, that's that's a beginning. Did the disciples <clears throat> have an issue amongst themselves? Did the disciples uh, in the beginning? I seem to think that was the case. I mean, the Sons of Thunder, these guys, this other guy, this other group, it seemed like everybody was contesting to be the best. So, in the beginning. Are we not talking for the three and a half years of Christ's ministry upon this earth? Yes. Now, we come to this three and a half years. We come to the cross. Now, for 40 days after the cross, the disciples, the 11 and others, had an intense study. They had a very intense class, as it were, in what Christ would have them to know. When Christ was then taken from them, they had nine days for this upper room experience. And in nine days, what did they do? They confessed their faults to one another and they prayed. They confessed to one another the feelings that they had had, the things that they had done that tore down their brothers and sisters. They came together through prayer and worship as a unit. And what was the result on that 50th day? Wasn't that when the Spirit was poured out? Exactly. We pray often for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We are asking for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon a body that is not unified, where the hand wants to go one way, the foot wants to go another, and the eye is looking at something that it shouldn't, and the mouth is running faster than anything else. Yeah, and then this is what we pointed out last night, is that we're expecting the outpouring of the latter rain, but we're not willing to go to the upper room. Right. And, and so we expect that we're ready for a Sunday law when we haven't done the necessary work, both on an individual level, but also in the giving of the message. 
So exactly. God, God can't empower us to give a message if we're unchristlike. If we are unwilling to accept his robe of righteousness, if we are unwilling to accept his character, how can he? How, how can this happen? If we are more willing to bow down to idols than we are to bow to Christ, how can we be ever expected to have his character in our lives? How can we expect to become righteous by faith if we are rejecting his righteousness. <clears throat> when they talk of the faults and the failings of others, they plant roots of bitterness, whereby many may be defiled. It is through this kind of work that brother becomes suspicious of brother. Confidence is unsettled and variance arises in the churches. Love cannot exist where the conversation is largely upon the errors and mistakes of others. The words of Christ are thus treated with contempt, as though frail, erring man had found some other way to heaven than that appointed by the Lord, the path of obedience to his commandments. Are we of such a mind today that we can set aside the very words and instruction of Christ. We all hope to reach the same home in heaven, but if Christ is not formed within, if you have not the mind of Christ and do not practice the words of Christ, if you are fully satisfied with your own peculiar ways so that you feel justified in complaining of your brethren, you will never reach heaven. If you cannot live in harmony on the earth, how could you live throughout eternity in love and peace? Uh, there's one one point here. Just uh, I don't mean to interrupt. Sort of this. Oh, you're thought. fine. But there's there's a thought that if because sometimes people are critical because they think other people are being critical. That is, if somebody is saying something, if we're discussing the Bible, there's nothing wrong with having a difference of opinion with the brother and trying to correct that difference of opinion through Bible study. Is that not iron sharpening iron? Yeah. So, so when we're studying the Bible and somebody has a point they don't understand or they have a difference, uh, there's a way to do that. You, you go to the Bible and you try to come to an understanding of first what the other person is saying, what their point is, because you may misunderstand their point. But also you need to see what the scripture says. But for some people... This they consider the work of criticizing. That is, they don't want to have any disagreements. And if you have a disagreement, if you disagree with someone, you are now being critical. But that's not what's being talked about here. What's being talked about is the criticism of the person. Exactly. Right. Did, did Paul and Peter get along on every point? No. no. Did anybody get along on every point? Of course not. Exactly. But if, if we don't have the Bible on our side, if we don't have truth on our side, we tend to criticism of the person. Which we are not to do. Right. Saying that, well, the reason this person has this position or holds this position is because they have some kind of character default that we, we somehow can discern or we know what is going on behind the scenes in that person's mind. Um, 
where that person has an attitude about us or something like that, and that's why um, that person's wrong. That's not how we approach the understanding of Scripture. That's not how we bring about unity of understanding of heart and mind. So, so we need to be clear what, what's being talked about here. Difference of opinion is not criticism. Discussing what somebody else um, is teaching and examining it is not criticism. But bringing up a person's past or aspects of their character as an argument against what they're saying is what she's discussing here. Taking their words out of context in a critical manner. Yeah. Kids saying that they're a heretic or, you know, yeah, painting their words in a false light, uh, using stories, rumor, and gossip regarding a person. These are the things that we should not do because this is the work that Satan did in heaven. And so we don't want to bring that rebellion, even though it's already here, to earth. We want to be in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We do not need that rebellion within the movement. Kindness, love, courtesy, and delicate regard must be manifested toward one another even here and now. To practice the principles of love, this will not prevent our dealing plainly with our brethren in brotherly kindness, pointing out shortcomings and wrongs when it is necessary to do so. But we must do this in harmony with the directions of Christ. When you are yourself connected with God, you may speak plainly to those who by their crooked steps are turning the lame out of the path. The apostle directs, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Galatians 6. Verse 1, Satan designs to keep the church in a state of wrangling, of envy, jealousy, and evil surmisings, so that the brethren cannot pray or work in harmony. While thus at variance, they fail to bring the saving power of the truth to bear upon the hearts of unbelievers. People become disgusted with religion when they witness the way in which a brother treats an offending brother. <clears throat> when the adversary employs his designs and the church is in a state of turmoil where there is backbiting, jealousy, gossip, how can we pray? How can we work? in harmony. How can we ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? For to do such, would that not bring upon our own destruction? Our Heavenly Father is righteous. Our Heavenly Father is holy. Can we stand before him when as a movement we're in this kind of a state? What would happen to us if we tried? We need to consider carefully what has been going on. We need to consider carefully what God would have us to do. It is the duty of every true follower of Christ to reflect light to the world. 
The message of July 18th was a reflection of such light. The actions taken after July 18th were not. God has laid upon us the responsibility of souls of those who are unsaved. Consider this, please, brothers and sisters. We have the responsibility of the souls of those who are unsaved. Those where we have light are responsible to provide that light. Yes, we need to understand how we can present this. Is this not the purpose that we've had in these studies since July 18th? So that we may understand, so that our minds that have been darkened may then be enlightened, so we may enlighten others. As an ambassador of Christ, I will tell you, brethren, that if you talk more of the merits of Christ, if you engaged more frequently in humble prayer and said less to your brethren about the failings of others, you would advance in spirituality and be far ahead, be far ahead of what you are now. How can we speak of the merits of Christ if we're setting aside the words of Christ? You must give the precious plant of love some chance to grow. Jesus has said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. John 13, 35. What symbol do we see here? Well, blessed is he that cometh to the 1335. Exactly. But do we also not have that combined with 1533? When we come to the 1335, when we come to this understanding, are we not coming in a spirit of love for one another? Can we not combine this with what we've seen in Daniel 12? He told his disciples to tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with, with power from on high, Luke 24, 49. one step away from 2450. And what was the symbol of the 2450? Was it not the great Jubilee? Said he, without me, you can do nothing. John 15, five. But Paul declares, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. We should be often in prayer. The outpouring of the Spirit of God came in answer to earnest prayer. The outpouring of the Spirit of God came in answer to earnest prayer, but also in the confession of sins to one another. in making things right between brothers and sisters. But mark this fact concerning the disciples. They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They were not assembled to relate tidbits of a scandal. 
They were not seeking to expose every stain that they could find on a brother's character. They felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the unction to help them in overcoming their own infirmities and to fit them for the work of saving others. How much more do we need this at this time? How much more do we need not only the outpouring of the Spirit of God, but for us to see our great need, considering ourselves as unworthy and lifting up our brothers and sisters. And, and this is a difficult point because um, we often talk about as Seventh-day Adventists and people in this movement, I mean, reaching others with the gospel. I mean, we're talking about the loud cry so that we can give a message to the world. And yet there are people around us that we are hurting. That is, we're not doing anything to save them. That is, if we have a criticism of a brother or sister, and we're not doing anything to help them in their overcoming, then, you know, we're not doing, there's no way that we're fit for the work of saving others, as she says, right? Because we have to, we, if, if we're not fit for the work of saving others, um, God isn't going to, to give us this power. And so often I will see, you know, somebody who's, who's struggling, and the question is, what am I going to do to help that person? If they're in error, um, me talking about them to others isn't really going to do any good to that person. I need to take time to talk to that person myself. Sometimes that person does exasperate the situation. When you talk to uh, other people about these things, all that does is aspirate stuff or act exasperate stuff. Yeah. And now sometimes it's difficult to talk to a person that, that we have hard feelings about or that has said things about us or, you know, is struggling in other ways because they may not want to hear us. And so sometimes we feel like, well, you know, there's nothing I can do. But the first thing we can do is examine our own hearts and see what there is that hinders us from communicating and helping others. Because sometimes we can see, well, this other person has a problem, but when we go to them, we go to them in the wrong spirit. It, we can go to them with an accusatory spirit. So we, we can think we've done our duty. I talked to them. They rejected what I said. Um, so I'm just going to treat, treat them as an unbeliever. But have we really done anything to redeem them? And that's, that's the questions we really have to ask ourselves. There was a comment in the chat, which we will place in the record with this. It was by the confession and forsaking of sin, by earnest prayer and consecration of themselves to God, that the early disciples prepared for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The same work, only in greater degree, must be done now. They felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the unction to help them in overcoming their own infirmities and to fit them for the work of saving others. They prayed with intense earnestness that the love of Christ might be shed abroad in their hearts. This is our great need today in every church in the land. For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, 
all things have become new. At this time in the upper room, was Paul involved? Negative. It was not for another three and a half years had passed before he had his initial understanding of that which had been occurring because it was not until the stoning of Stephen that he took up the mindset that this movement should be eradicated. Soon after that, he had his experience face to face with Christ. Those that were in the upper room met, prayed, confessed their sins, and this allowed Saul to become Paul. Because it was through their witness that which they were doing to present this message that Paul, the great apostle, joined with them. <laughs> and yeah, that scared the bejesus out of them. Okay. But that which was objectionable in the character is purified from the soul by the love of Jesus, just as it did for Peter, James, and John, so it was done for Paul. All selfishness is expelled, all envy, all evil speaking is rooted out, and a radical transformation is wrought in the life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, goodness, faith, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Please consider this, brothers and sisters. Is the book of Galatians written for the movement today? Uh, yeah, all the books are. No, I'm saying specifically the book of Galatians. For have we not had greater light presented us than the Galatians did? Yet we are in a situation where we are choosing that that it, it's okay to be critical of others. If this is found within us, we have a great work within ourselves. There are too many that have been critical of that which is going on. And for them, I feel immensely sad. This is not what we are to be doing. Again, now the passage that was, that was read earlier was from Testimonies for Ministers 507.1. But another comment has been made, Matthew 20, 27. And, whatso and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. We are not here to be lords over other brothers and sisters. We are to be servants to one another. But may it not be said of us, who has bewitched you, as was said of the Galatians.
The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. James 3.18. Paul says that as touching the law, as far as outward acts are concerned, he was blameless. Philippians 3.6. But when the spiritual character of the law was discerned, and when he looked into the holy mirror, he saw himself a sinner. What vision is the holy mirror? Is it the calzone? Is it the mare? Or is it the mara? Well, it's the mare, because uh, mara is the the uh, the twenty five um, or the the twenty three hundred days. I thought it was the mare that was the 20, 2300 and the mara was the two twenty. I don't know. I always get it mixed up because I think people pronounce them wrong. But anyway, what, so the one that we see where we see Christ, it's a revelation of Christ. The looking glass, yeah, is not a looking glass a mirror. Mm -hmm. When he saw the spiritual character of the law, when he discerned the spiritual character of the law, and when he looked into the looking glass, he saw himself a sinner. Judged by a human standard, he had abstained from sin. But when he looked into the depths of God's law and saw himself as God saw him, he bowed in humiliation and confessed his guilt. When this vision was given to Daniel, did he not fall upon his face as one dead? Was the same experience not given to Moses, to Ezekiel, and to John the Revelator? Is this not to be our experience when we are looking to Christ? He did not go away from the mirror and forget what manner of man he was, but he exercised genuine repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He was washed. He was cleansed. He says, I had not known sin except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of Concupiscence. Yeah, concupiscence or concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Romans 7, 7 through 9. Sin then appeared in its true hideousness. And his self-esteem was gone. He was humble. He no longer had ascribed goodness and merit to himself. He ceased to think more highly of himself than he ought to think and ascribed all the glory to God. He was no longer sensitive to reproach, to neglect, or contempt. He no longer sought earthly alliance, station, or honor. He did not pull others down to uplift himself. He became gentle, condescending, meek, and lowly of heart because he had learned his lesson in the school of Christ. Whenever we seek to pull another down so that we may be uplifted, we are yet doing the work of the adversary. We are yet standing under his banner and standing against Christ. He talked of Jesus and his matchless love, grew more and more into his matchless image. 
he bent his whole energy to win souls to Christ. When trial came upon him because of his unselfish love for souls, he bowed in prayer and his love for them increased. His life was hid with Christ in God. And he loved Jesus with all the ardor of his nature. Every church was dear to him. Every church member was a person of interest to him. For he looked upon every soul as the purchase of the blood of Christ. How often do we do this today? How often do we look upon our other brothers and sisters in this manner? How often do we esteem them more worthy than we esteem ourselves? This should be the experience of every member of our churches. We are to bear the precious fruits of the Spirit of God to his glory. Even rich clusters of fruit that will make us more precious than the golden wedge of Ophir. Brethren, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. Is it not better to be uplifted by God than it is to try to tear someone down to lift yourself up? How can you lift yourself up if you tear someone else down? You are then taking your own efforts and standing on one that you have pulled down. The hand it just, of it just, it just feeds your pride more and more. And we're not to feed our pride. All right. Are we? All right. How much are we then not relying on the mighty hand of God? How much more can God lift us up? then can we lift ourselves up? And if we are lifted up of God, who can pull us down? If a fountain that is rank and bitter loses its corrupt qualities, those who drink of it will recognize the change. The water will be pure and sweet and the streams that flow from it wholesome and refreshing. What kind of water is this? Is this not the water that Christ spoke of to the woman of Samaria that is living water? Is this not the kind of water where once we drink, we will never again thirst? The members of the Church of St. Helena need a deeper work of grace wrought in their souls, or they will be found wanting in the day of God. Many, many, tekel, you farsen, weighed in the balance and found wanting. We must be found faithful stewards of the grace of God, or we shall be represented by the parable of the foolish virgins who took their lamps but had no oil in them. Consider this for a moment, brothers, sisters. We must be found faithful stewards of the grace of God. How can we be faithful stewards of something that we don't accept in our own lives? How can we be faithful stewards of something that we are to freely give to others? Because when we impart unto others, is, are we not making room for more light for ourselves that we can then share with others? We must have the oil of grace in our vessels. The lamps must be trimmed and burning, and we be ready to meet the bridegroom. 
How many of us today are ready to meet the bridegroom? How many of us have no spot, no stain, no wrinkle upon our characters? Yet we are told we must be ready to meet the bridegroom. In the past, the Lord has signified that Brother Rogers should connect with the health retreat at Crystal Springs. This brother has made mistakes, and he has been critical and has not always encouraged those who have been working under him. He's had experience and knowledge in treating the sick, which he might have used to the glory of God. He might have been far advanced in practical knowledge so as to be a helper in the institution if he had gone forward and upward since his connection with the work. But I saw that the rebuke of God was upon him because he has not stood at his appointed place of duty until he was honorably released. When trouble arose, he should have gone directly to Brother Fulton, Baker, and Loughborough and laid his case and all the circumstances connected with it before them and let them know the true situation. But instead of doing this, he disconnected himself from the work, and some felt a sense of relief that he had done so. But I can see no other way than for Brother Rogers to see his mistake and so far as possible correct it. He has been at fault in criticizing others. And he should confess this, humble himself before a position that he can fill to serve the cause of God by devotion and faithfulness, endeavoring to redeem his failings of the past. If he has been falsely accused, he must take it as a Christian should, and by his life prove the accusation to have been false. He must not feel that his dignity has been wounded and take himself away from his appointed work. If he had but stood faithfully at his place, he would have won precious victories, but he has need to humble himself as a little child before God and in no way dishonor his Redeemer. Brethren, God would work for us if he could do it safely. He wants to do great things for his people, but the strife of tongues has dishonored God, weakened the hands of his professed children, and brought dearth and feebleness into the church. Is it not time to arise, to open the heart and receive the rays of light that are shining forth from the living oracles? Is it not time that the love of God should be permitted to make its imprint upon the soul that Jesus may be glorified among those who claim to be his followers? Brother Rogers, if your brethren open the way, and you are willing to do what you can at the institution in the meekness of Christ, the Lord will accept the efforts that you put forth in his cause, but self must be hid in Jesus. The Lord wants every soul in the church at St. Helena and Crystal Springs to obey his words, to learn of his will, and to heed his requirements. The Lord wants the movement to come together. There must be a decided change in the church. There must be a decided change in the movement. In the place of gossip and censure, there must be a spirit of sympathy, of willingness and desire to strengthen the hands that hang down and to confirm the feeble needs. You are to be constantly seeking for precious pearls of truth. There must be a dying to the world. No cowardice 
nor compromise. There must be a seeking for that wisdom that is from above. The apostle asks, who is a wise man and endured, endued with knowledge among you? Let him show of a good conversation his words with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that maketh peace. James 3, 13 to 18. May the Lord give you wisdom that you may heed the words I now present to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now there was further counsel given. The erring ones who have their sins laid open before them, many of them, not all, thank God, will feel that they are misjudged. They will vindicate their own course, justifying themselves, and will become alienated from those who, in the fear of God, tried to do the very work the Lord had given them to do, namely to reprove, to rebuke, and to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The reproved ones who do not humble their hearts before God will not confess their sins, which are not all specified but will cover them up and make light of their errors and grievous transgressions, which have been a stumbling block to saints and sinners and have corrupted souls. Is this to be a work that is done in secret? Is this to be a work that is done with a few, with a council of a few directed at one or two? Well, first, if you have a problem with a brother, you see them in error, you need to go to them individually. Correct. So you, you do a work with them first. Now, if, if it's such a thing that's disruptive to the work and to that person's salvation, you may need to bring some other people with you. So depending on what, what this situation is. But, you know, I've had many times where people have had a problem with me and they've come to me personally. And we talked about it and we prayed about it. And that's always a blessing. Yes. Right. It, I, I've never found that when somebody has done that, that I've so resented them doing it. But if they go to other people and they spread these stories or they have an attitude towards you publicly because of this thing that they've never talked to you about personally, then that becomes destructive. It becomes destructive as well when there is a confederacy. And where the confederacy is not in keeping with the instructions of Christ. I've seen this, uh, the excuse made um, that something was done publicly, so it needs to be rebuked publicly. But there is no support for that in the Bible or spirit of prophecy. Right. Somebody may have done something that's public, but you still need to go to them as an individual in private. First, individually. Second, taking two or three, third before the church. Yeah. And so, so there is no support for this idea that somebody did something publicly, so now we can talk about it publicly and we can rebuke them publicly. Right. And often we rebuke them right away, which isn't always the right thing to do. I remember um, there was a pastor who had 
done a sermon while he was actually the ministerial director in the Alberta Conference. And he did his sermon in Warburg Church. And um, I wrote him a letter afterwards. I didn't rebuke him right there at the time. And and what he was, was presenting was liberal Adventism. So I wrote him a letter. The next time he came to Warburg Church and presented he presented the straight testimony. And I saw him preaching at another church, and he gave his testimony on what had happened and how he had been a closet conservative for many years. But because of his job in the conference, um, he had presented a more liberal doctrine and that he now had taken a stand for, for the truth and he didn't expect his job to last long, and it didn't. He, he quickly was removed from that position. But the thing is, in order to correct him, uh, it was done privately. Not to embarrass him or make him feel bad. Right. Exactly. They will place the matter in a false light before their friends and relatives. The very thing that gained for Satan the sympathy of one third of the angels in heaven was this spirit of self justification. The angels were deceived by Satan's misrepresentations and by his artful power of accusing those who would not unite with him. Satan has kept up this work ever since his fall. And he has large numbers of men and women who follow in the very steps that he has taken until they fall from the truth, give up their steadfastness, and stand on Satan's side as accusers criticizing others. While they seem to think their own ways are hid from the Lord, that God does not know, and that he doth not take knowledge of their ways or their crooked works. Now this very work has been going on at the health retreat and shall a, ver a few carry the heavy load and all others be spectators? Shall there be none who will feel an interest in every part of God's plans and his instrumentalities because there have been men and women who by their want of devotion and piety have been imperiled have imperiled the cause and the work of God, men and women who have been so circumstanced that they have developed character and revealed that all was not gold, but dross and tin. Shall not this be the time when all who are in connection with God shall come to the front and show their colors? Shall it be seen that men and women step back and show no interest, no zeal, no earnest effort when help is needed? When the car drags heavily, there is the time for everyone to push, put shoulders to the wheels and not stand back, giving orders or accusing the ones who are trying to push the load or criticizing everything that they do because it's not done in their way and after their ideas. One thinks things should be done after his way. Another shouts out his orders to do things after his way. And there is not concerted action. Let everyone do his level best to move the load with might and strength. It is the duty of all to do this. If the Lord should treat us as some that claim to be Christians treat one another, we should have a sore, hard time. If he should look upon the selfish, the erring, or crooked ones as they look upon one another and deal with one another, what would become of us? But I am glad the Lord is not man. He bears with our crooked ways, our selfishness, our separation from him, our defects of character, and seeks to inform us, sending message after message of mercy, encouragement, of warning, of reproof, and correction, 
to bring us to a right position before him, that we may have his love, his care, his blessing abiding upon us. But if we choose our own selfish, perverse ways, then the Lord, after every means is exhausted, says, let them alone. They are joined to their idols. Is this what we wish to hear from our Lord and Savior? We have a decision before us. The movement has a decision before it. The body has not been in unity. The body has had limbs, fingers, toes, and other items going in different directions. We have not been as the movement is to be. We have been like Ephraim. The admonition is to leave Ephraim alone. He is joined unto his idols. Is this the position that we wish to be in? at this time in this earth's history. We are now coming close to the close of our time together. We must carefully consider that which Mrs. White has written. We must carefully consider that which is presented where do we choose to stand today? Are we standing under the banner, the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel? Or are we standing under the black banner of the great apostate? Choose you this day whom you will serve. Shall we now close with prayer? Heavenly Father, looking in this mirror where we see your reflection is not easy. For we see ourselves as you see us. We no longer want to worry about how man sees us. We see ourselves in the frail, disgusting way. that you are having to see us, yet you see us as having worth. Otherwise, you would not have sent your son. Be with us today, please. Direct us so that we may walk according to your path. So that that which is within us, that is dross, may be purged. And so that the pure metal that you see in us may yet be revealed. Prepare us, please. Help us through the tests, through the trials, 
through all that you send to gladly accept this for the more we are tested, the more we are proved either to be worthy of your character or that we are not ready. There are only two classes. Help us that we may be found ready to be of your class. Direct us today, help us so that we will not be joined to any idol, but that we may worship you in spirit and truth. For this we thank you, and for this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.